What's going on, everyone? This is Jay Wicker with Real Estate Aholics. And we got some great topics going on today. But before we get to those topics, man, I'll get to that, that topic, you know, that dope mind. We got a couple of great entrepreneurs on here, co-hosts. Um, starting from Mr. Cody. Tell me hey, where hey. you are in from. What do you do? All that good stuff. Well, thank you very much, Jan. It's always a pleasure to be a part of this group here. So I'm Cody Cox, a, uh, a CEO of a company called Bridge City Factors. We actually are a note business. Uh, Bridge City Factors itself is a management company that manages note funds. Uh, and we have a, a, a partner note fund called BCF Fund One, where we actually raise some capital. Uh, it's a Regulation C 506B fund where we've raised some capital from investors. We use that capital to purchase notes and place them in our inventory. And then the payments that come in from our, our borrowers on this, we pay back the investors that are part of the fund. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's a little different than I, I like to strike a difference and we'll probably get into this a little deeper between running a note business like I do versus note investing, which I also do, uh, but they're two separate things, although they have a lot of similarities in what they do. Uh, I'm out of the Northwest. I'm headquartered just south of Portland, Oregon, uh, but I'm doing some business travel. I'm actually heading to a conference that starts tomorrow evening in Nashville that is called Diversified Mortgage Expo, which is all about note investing. And there's about 350 of us that are coming together for a two and a half day conference. And I'm honored to get to moderate a panel on Friday morning. So I'm excited about that as well. Right, so you're the moderator, huh? I uh, yeah, that's one of the cool. panels I get to do that. Yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent. Oh man, that's pretty cute. That's pretty cute. You said how many people? It'll be about 300, 350 people there. So. Oh wow. Okay. Absolutely, man. Keep keep rocking. What's up, Lenny? Can't uh, hear you, uh, Lenny. You're on mute. Oh, there we go. There oh, we go. There you go. What is going on? Uh, not much, not much. So, Jay, go ahead and uh, jump in right quick. Tell us where you're logging in from, what do you do, all that good stuff. All right, well, this is uh, Jarrell coming out of uh, Atlanta. I am a hard money broker funding real estate from fix and flips, um, buying commercial property and multifamily properties. Uh, if you, you know, looking for a loan getting um 90 percent of purchase price on your fix and flips i'm your guy uh, i'm looking for 80 percent uh refinances i'm your guy uh just hit me up at on um, bpi quick loans at gmail.com uh, excellent excellent lenny right on time man tell them okay. where you logging in from what do you do all that good stuff what up guys my name is lenny man i'm the host of the host lenny um also the admin of the creative financer with Lenny Group over on Facebook. Um, I'm a buy and hold investor. I use wholesaling real estate towards my pretty much um, to buy my real estate. I also use creative uh, finance methods to buy real estate, man. And, you know, if anybody's ever looking for some help, man, hit me up. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. So these are the investors here, man. It's real estate hauls, guys. Uh, so look, man, we got some a great topic, man. Um, we're gonna talk touch on, man. So look forward to hearing you guys' comments on these things on, on, on these things we're gonna talk about today. So today, man, we're talking about buying mortgage notes. Um, I've heard about this um, forever, right? Never never thought about getting into this aspect of real estate. Um, but after me doing my due diligence, man, I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And we're gonna dive right into this thing, man, and show you guys how cool it really is. So. The question, the first question we're going to jump out at is, uh, what is a mortgage note? What is that? So a mortgage note is a legal rec uh, recorded for a buyer promise to pay loan. That's what a mortgage note is. What do you, so, so technically, man, a mortgage note, man, I mean, a note is something that we probably all have had to uh, a greater or lesser extent. Maybe not a mortgage note if we never purchased a property, but if you would purchase a car, you deal with notes, a promise to repay, right? <laughs> so kind of the same thing. Would, would you would you guys say that? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, that goes back to me saying, you know, when I buy my real estate creatively, whenever I whenever I buy my real estate creatively, we always create a note, right? So we always yeah. create a note whenever we do a seller carry, you know. So definitely, man, 
I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. So so where does that be, does that need to be recorded when you're dealing with real estate? So, uh, Jay, uh, there, there's actually two documents that are involved in that if we're talking real estate. One is the promissory note that we've talked about here. And, of course, that is the borrower's uh, signed obligation to pay, repay back, to pay on the mortgage itself. And so uh, that's the document that says I'm going to pay this loan. It also sets all the terms, what the length of the loan is, what the interest rate is, what the monthly payment is, if it's going to be a fixed rate loan, if it's going to have some adjustable capabilities of it. Uh, is there a balloon payment on it? Are you going to make payments like it's a 30-year loan, but then it balloons after 10 years? And so those things are all spelled out in the promissory note, which is a promise to repay. But the associated document with that is either, uh, uh, depending on the state, a mortgage or a deed of trust. And so the mortgage or the deed of trust is a document that says that uh, if you do not make your monthly payment, the lender has the right to foreclose on the property and take back the property as the collateral for the note. So, so that's, that's really kind of the two main documents that are involved in a real estate transaction. And again, there are difference between whether it's a mortgage in certain states or whether it's a, a deed of trust. Most of us out on the West Coast use a deed of trust. Uh, and the primary difference in a deed of trust versus a mortgage is that uh, a deed of trust allows us to foreclose on the property without going to court. It has what's called a, uh, it, it, it pleads, uh, it, it says in it uh, that we can do what's called a power of sale and advertise for four to six weeks, depending on the state guidelines, in the public uh, newspaper of record and then execute what's called a non-judicial foreclosure. So that means you don't have to go to court. But in the in the states that have a, a actual mortgage, which you know is kind of the the generic term of all this, the mo mortgage does not have that power of sale clause, so you have to go to court in order to foreclose on a property. Mm. Wow. So you so you have a you see, a, a, a deed of a deed of trust. Yeah. You have mortgage note. Yeah, or what we call a promissory note. Probably yeah, because like, okay. that's, that's a promise to repay, and that's supplemented by the mortgage or the deed of trust. Yeah, so those two documents uh, are really when you're buying a note, you're actually buying a file. You're buying a file yeah. that contains what we call a collateral file. And the collateral file typically is the original note, promissory note, the original deed of trust. Obviously, the deed of trust is the document that gets recorded with the respective county. Uh, then you have what's called an assignment of deed of trust. So whoever owns that deed of trust is going to assign that over to my company. And then they also do an endorsement to the note, which can be called an endorsement. Yeah, very good. Good job. See, there's a deed of trust there that Lenny's showing up. Uh, so they're yeah. going to assign that note over to us and endorse it over to us uh, in, in the form of endorsement. Uh, in in a couple different fashions, you can do that. So yeah, absolutely. Blow, blow that up again, Jack, uh, 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 Lenny. Hey, Lenny, let's see that again, Lenny. <laughs> you might want to white out the stuff you got on there, though. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Hmm. So, so so I think that's 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 interesting, man. So you there are two is two instruments that's in play here. Right. Yeah. So one yeah. is the person who owns the who actually owns the debt. Another person who actually <laughs> who don't in that situation. Right. So it's right. doing a contract for deed. You're doing. Uh, so the mortgage note is where I'm going to make sure I'm saying this right. So the mortgage note is the person who owns the debt. Right. And that situation. that's the person who owes the money to the lender. The, correct. The, the owns the money to the lender. Correct. Yeah. And the contract for deed. OK. OK. That makes sense. Yeah. Contract uh, for deed got, is a different animal. It's a different subject. Because in okay. a contract for deed, the owner of the property is selling it to a buyer on a, on a land contract, but is retaining the title. 
And exactly. so there's, they have okay. a contractual interest in the property, but the title is still held by the original lender. And oftentimes that's an instrument gets used when there's maybe a private sale or a seller finance deal, uh, you know, guy, those kind of situations. And so they're a little different animal and they require a little bit different a process or due diligence if you want to purchase the land contract or contract for deed uh, versus uh, purchase the promissory note. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. Somebody said something? No. So 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 my, one of my questions. Go ahead, Lydia. Did that was that you saying something? Well, no, I was just agreeing with Cody. Okay. So my so one of my questions is in this situation. So um, so how do you do your due diligence on a note though? Like where do you get that information from? I so, guess it'd be from a bank in that situation, right? It, it depends on who the seller is. And I buy loans. You know, I buy, in fact, my, my model is a little bit different in which I buy existing institutionally originated mortgages or deed of trust, promissory notes secured by real estate. And so if I've, and typically they come to me with a whole list of notes that they're trying to sell, which we call a tape. And so I will try and choose out of that tape based on the information that that note seller puts in the tape, such as the address, what they're looking for, what the unpaid principal balance is, what the rearage are, what the interest rate is. And, and if I can determine what they think the value is. And so I go through a preliminary preliminary due diligence to see is this a note that meets my general model? And mostly what I'm looking at is, is this going to provide me a return if I pay X number of dollars for this. And so if I submit to them what we call an indicative bid and they accept my bid, then I proceed into a full-fledged due diligence. And so I ask for them to send me all the information in their file, that's the collateral file, their payment history, you know, any sort of borrower notes. And hopefully that loan has been serviced by a licensed loan servicer. And, and then I have some other type of documents that I order. I'll do what's called a errors. Uh, it's called a, a ownership and encumbrance report, an O&E, &E, which basically is a title review over the last several years. And I also do what's called a BPO, a, 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 a broker price broker opinion. Price. Yeah, that yeah. tells me what they think the value is. And so with all those documents, uh, I go through a process of, of doing some due diligence to make sure that my indicative bid is at a proper level based on the quality of that house, the quality of the paper that I'm looking to buy, and the completeness of the collateral package. Because really all I'm buying is a file like Lenny just pulled up there. He's got a file of documents in there. And when you're buying a note, that's what you buy. You're not buying the real estate. You're buying the paper that secures that piece of real estate. <sighs> Man, that's a cold game there, man. It's funny, man, that, I mean, you first get in this game, right? You don't really hear about uh, <laughs> buying notes, right? The first thing you hear about is is, <laughs> is wholesaling or whatever the case is, right? Yeah, so, so this is that next level. This is that next level. This is that behind the scenes. Yeah, the first thing you hear about how to grab a check. That's yeah. the first thing you usually hear about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, when you get into notes, now you're talking about generating wealth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I, what I learned too, man, you can get it fast and you can get it slow too. So I know a lot of times what they call it, recapitalization or whatever the case is, some ways that you can come up off the notes partially or sell it whole or whatever the case is. So, because most people think that once you buy these notes that you're stuck in it for the 20, 30 years or whatever the case is, right? Not necessarily that, that from the case. That's my understanding of my research that you can actually get a person who may want to buy partial of it. Or you want to buy the whole deal or whatever the case is. So you don't have to be locked in for all that length of time. Mm -hmm. But I will say the best place to be is where the bank is at. Right? The bank, the banks are in that position for a reason. They know they're gonna make money over time, especially if it's if it's a performing loan, right? But as we learned a little bit, there's this thing called non-performing loan too, but which can be a great thing to to invest in as well, because you can you know, hopefully get that turned around. So so yeah, this is this is interesting. This is really interesting. All right, here's the next one here. So what is a non-performing uh, versus a performing note, right? What is non-performing? Um, I think I kind of just touched on it a little bit. Anyone of you guys want to jump on that? What's a non-performing note? 
But so I jump on it. I jump on it. Okay. So a non-performing is basically it's a, it's a note that the, maybe the bank holds where the person is not paying their their mortgage, right? They may be behind two, three, four, five months, or maybe a year, whatever the case is, right? So it's non-performing. So the bank is not making any money off this loan. So a lot of times the banks are willing to sell these at a, at a discount just to get it off their books, right? So performer loan is just the opposite of that. It's somebody who's paying it every single month. So of course, if they want to sell it, they're not going to sell it at a deep discount normally, right? Uh, they want to sell it at the highest, highest amount possible. Am I saying that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of models that either target non-performing or, or, performing loans you know there's another category that's called re-performing loans which is when the current note holder has a non-performing and they get to get them to a point where that borrower is now back on track and so they are re-performing yeah. and so there's kind of three three things there uh as far as what type of loans and obviously the better loans, the performing loans are going to demand a higher price than somebody that's a non-performing loan. And, and so one of the things we try and do when we buy non-performing loans, there's really three outcomes that can come on that. Okay. And obviously the outcome that we all want to happen is to find a way to keep that borrower in the house, try and find if there's a mitigation type of situation that we can work up some sort of adjustment, a modification or whatever to keep them in the house. Uh, you know, the unfortunate part of that only works about mm, 30 to 35% of the time. Uh, the other op option is what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So if that borrower, we've come to the conclusion that particular borrower is unable to, uh, you know, to come up with a way to make the payment, bring the loan current, and you're kind of a situation that, you know, you're going to take the house back, you oftentimes can... Uh, you know, go through a lot, uh, a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which basically says they're just going to deed that property over to you without going through the whole foreclosure process. And, and that happens about 30 to 35 percent of that time. And sometimes it can happen because there are underlying liens, second mortgage or something like that that don't get wiped out. You assume those if you accept a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And then, of course, the third and, and the last choice is to actually go through a full foreclosure uh, where the borrower ends up losing the house, the bank takes it back, and then any subordinate liens get completely wiped out. Uh, and I know that there are people out there that like to buy non-performing liens, loans, mortgage loans, because they will go ahead and foreclose, and then they will take that property and rehab it and put it back on, out on the market to resale, or they can oftentimes will keep it in their own portfolio as a rental house. Or what's real popular right now is selling that property to somebody else uh, on a deed of trust and transferring yeah. the title. And so there's a lot of folks that do that seller financing. So uh, where'd those guys go? So uh, uh, they popped off either, but hopefully you pop back on here to say it. Oh, there, okay, I, I see Lenny's got right. something to do, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so that's so. I, that's what I, I thought about too, man. Like, okay, so why would a person buy a non-performing loan? Because if it, if it, it sounds like it doesn't make sense, right? So you mean to tell me I'm gonna spend X amount of dollars on a loan uh, on a house that a person who's living in it is not even making a mortgage payment on the property, right? So, like you said, it has to be some some great situations in, in that situation in that property where to where maybe you get it at a deep discount. Um, yeah. Maybe that person just, you know, just ran a snag or whatever the case is. Now he's back on track or whatever. So you, you really need to see the story behind yeah. it. Yeah, and that's uh, all part of the due diligence process as you analyze, especially one of the important parts. Not only do you want to get a payment history of that particular borrower when you're going through the uh, the due diligence process, but you also want to get the call log, what's called the borrower call log, which looks at the conversations that that loan servicer has had with that borrower to try and develop what that story is. Okay, I've never heard of that before, so it's called a call log. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. so every time anybody calls into their mortgage company and they have a conversation with their customer service rep a representative, that conversation that gets logged in. You know, they type it in with some with some keywords and things like that. So that's always something that can be re reviewed and becomes a permanent part of the record. Yeah, that makes sense. I was a, I was a mortgage broker for some years. 
Um, and I remember seeing some things like that, <laughs> right? I didn't yeah. understand what it was about, you know, but yeah. now I'm on the other side of this thing. So that all makes sense. So, yeah, man, and that, and that it's just like anything you do, especially with real estate, you need to understand the situation. You know, the person who knows more probably get the better deal, right? Uh, um, uh, it should be more comfortable moving forward as long as you know the situation. So you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, there is an education process in this because as, as you've already talked about, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's it's different from wholesaling properties. It's different from owning rentals uh, because you're now the bank. And what I jokingly like to say, I'm not the landlord, I'm the lien lord. And so yeah. I don't get the calls at two o'clock in the morning when the toilet breaks because I don't own the property. I own the paper and hopefully the owner of the house, you know, is the owner of the house and they're the ones that have to deal with the broken toilet. So looks like we say yeah. no toilets, no termites, no tenants. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so here's the next one, right? So the question is, um, how to find a note seller, right? Or somebody who's in need of selling um, that note. They're know the whatever the case is. I know, I know like with wholesaling, right? You you want to talk to that person to see what their situation is and you tailor your offer to fit whatever their situation is. Is that kind of the same way when it comes to notes as well? Or you just got to have like a... It's no? a little okay. different. Yeah, it's a little different because it's all relationship build, building. You have to have relationships with like the banks that you've talked about. Uh, I gotcha. deal with several different hedge funds that work directly with the bank and the hedge funds will purchase a large block of loans and then parcel those out so I can buy five, six, eight or 10 at a time. Uh, and so having relationships with banks, savings and loans, if those exist anymore, credit unions, uh, hedge funds. And then there's a couple different what's called an exchange on the marketplace. There's certain exchanges where you can go in and purchase notes on a one off basis where if I want to sell one note, I can sell my note on an exchange. And then somebody yeah. out there will look at it and say, this seems to fit my profile, my model, and then we'll entertain an, a negotiation standpoint right through that exchange. So there's a number of different ways to acquire notes if you're buying that type of note. Now, the other thing we touched on a little bit, which is not exactly in my model, is, is buying seller finance notes where you have a, a seller who sells his house to somebody else. Maybe they can't get a traditional mortgage. So that seller decides to sell it to them, carry the paper, and then that note is marketable. It is a commodity. And all those notes are shown since the mortgage or the deed of trust is recorded. If you have a relationship with a local title insurance company and you can ask that title insurance representative to pro produce a farm, of recently recorded seller finance notes or seller finance mortgages, they can give you a list and then you could market to those sellers. Mm. Buy the note directly <laughs> from a seller. So, so that's another aspect, another way to do that. You can do a little bit locally. So, you know, if you wanted to do a, a, a 25 mile radius around your office, you would go to your title company and say, can you look at uh, the, Every, any sort of recently recorded or whatever date you want, whether it's two years or whatever, of privately financed seller finance mortgage notes, whether it be a first mortgage or a second mortgage, uh, and have them do a farm list for you. And then you can set up a marketing campaign to those folks because, you know, everybody would like their cash right now and they're willing maybe to take a little discount you know, due to the, the velocity of capital to buy it now for a discount, whether rather than wait, you know, for the next 10 to 15 years for that loan to pay off. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, man, <laughs> that, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, so we have another one here. So here's a question. You know, how to sell a mortgage note? I guess it's kind of, kind of the same, right? I mean, you got people who are out there who are in, um, Let's say REI meetup groups, right? You may be doing the same thing that you're doing. You yep. may be part of that group. They may have a group that you can post things on it. And, hey, man, I got this particular. Does this fit your criteria, whatever the case is? And there it is. All right. <laughs> so, so I guess it wouldn't be a problem. If it's a great deal, just like any real estate, you run across a great deal, it pretty much sells itself. It, yeah, in a lot of ways, that's exactly right. And so marketing those out is, is uh, there's a number of different ways to do it. 
Uh, and a lot of it depends on if you're marketing to the type of buyer that are looking for that particular type of note. And so, you know, there's, I, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, you know, there's a difference between being in the mortgage or the note business versus being a note investor. And so if I'm a note investor, I may only have the capital to buy one or two at a time. And so those type of situations, as far as selling it out, if you have one to sell, you know, you're going to look for those folks that want to buy one or two at a time or one offs as we call them. And that way I can put those loans in my own personal portfolio and have that borrower make the payments to me. Now, what I like to do is I like to buy notes in my self-directed IRA. And so all those particular notes pay me tax free because the borrower is making payments right to my IRA. And so that's a pass <laughs> passive income play that becomes non-taxable or maybe tax deferred, depending on the type of RRA. And so when somebody's looking at their overall, you know, investment portfolio, you know, I always like to say, make sure you're taking full use of your self-directed IRA to try and increase that balance as fast as you can, as high as you can, tax free. So, so that's, that's yeah. one thing to do. And mortgage notes are one of those consistent things. You get a good borrower, they're going to make their payment every night, just like clockwork. Yep. So, yep. so. Now, I hope you guys understood what he just said. Uh, you buy it with your self-directed IRA, right? So, you know, the IRA is, uh, was it, it's post-tax. So you're using it for real estate. Like you, like you just talked about, <clears throat> it can become a tax, um, tax free situation here. So, and then we learned a couple of extra episodes ago that there's ways that you can roll your 401k possibly into a Roth IRA. <laughs> so, and, and actually do this thing, man, without paying any taxes doing it, man. Let that thing continue to compound and make you money. That's your, that's your retirement. <laughs> so if you wait on what, what's the, you know, these different things, the government will be offers when we get older, man, it may not be here. Man, that, that is huge. I wish I'd have knew about this when I was younger. <laughs> I wish well, I would have known when I was younger. Well, well, the thing of it is, it's not too late. I mean, if you have. It's not too late. Yeah, it's, it's not, not too, late. too late for anybody on this phone call, because if you just have the right custodian for your IRA, they will allow you to purchase alternative investments in that. And ones I target are promissory notes secured by residential real estate. But you can also buy commercial properties. You can also buy apartment complexes. And I know yeah. some of the guys you have on as co-hosts from time to time like the multifamily type properties. You like the multifamily type yeah. properties. So you can actually acquire a apartment complex in your IRA. Yep. Absolutely. And there's also lending opportunities out there, too, that will, you know, your IRA provides the down payment. You can borrow money from a lender that's called a non-recourse lender. Yep. And you can acquire, yep. you know, a higher price type uh, uh, apartment complex or, or whatever you want to in that for that fashion. Uh, again, purchase something that creates an income stream that you can use when you're actually into that retirement. Yeah, it, it seems and some, most people would probably think that this would, you know, to do to buy mortgage notes, it's going to cost you a whole lot of money. But you don't have to. And, and there's a lot of situations you don't have to have a hundred thousand dollars. Right? You, it depends on where you're looking at and what kind of deal you find. Man, it could be ten grand to get you started. <laughs> you see something in the area, maybe put ten grand on it, buy it or whatever the case is. Maybe put a few bucks into it or whatever. And you never know, man, that that, that property value may rise, and then there you go. Uh, you sell it and put it right back in your Roth IRA and look for something a little bigger or something a little nicer. Before you know it, you, you, your, your pile is, is going high and high and you got plenty of money to retire on. So, yeah, this this is a great thing. Well, let me this give you a little a case thing. story if I can. Okay, I'll tell you about the first note okay. I bought. Okay, it was in an IRA. It was a non-performing loan uh, that was in a place called Klamath Falls, Oregon. Okay, which is down in the in the central part of the uh, southern part of the state of Oregon. Uh, it was uh, the loan was originated in like 2006, and this uh, gal from uh, California had bought the property. She brought it as a second home, uh, but she never visited the property, and it immediately went south. It went into uh, severely delinquent. I think it was three or four years delinquent when I finally bought the note. I bought the note for twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Okay, spent a little money because I wanted to board it up and make sure that there were no, you know, transients in it or any sort of homeless people doing it. And so, uh, and so I tried to contact the lady 
to do what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure because they didn't want to go through a full-fledged foreclosure. So I always like to offer, would you do a deed in lieu? And so somehow I found a guy who was able to track her down in Southern California. And I told her, uh, because of being a non-owner occupied or a second home, uh, there was a way that I could sue uh, for it, what's called a deficiency judgment. So if I sold it at auction for $50,000, but she owed me $100,000, I could sue her for that deficiency of $50,000. So yeah. what I offer to her is if you give me a deed in lieu of foreclosure, I will waive my right to sue for the deficiency judgment. And so she did. She signed the property over to me. And uh, that was on like, what was what was it? May 7th of one year. I listed it with a realtor on May 5th and sold it by May 12th. By the end of May, I had it sold. I sold it for $25,000. I owned the property. Uh, I, I bought the note, held the note for about eight months and uh, bought it for 12,000, sold it for 25,000. And it was 103% return on, into my IRA on that transaction. I was hooked. <laughs> I was hooked. Tax free. And so the there purpose is. of saying all that, exactly what you talked about, Jay, is you don't need a lot of capital in most yeah. situations, uh, in a lot of situations, uh, to purchase a mortgage note. You know, another opportunity is to purchase what you've talked about or said a couple of times. It's what's called a partial. And somebody has a note out there that they own and you want to buy the first, say, 60 months of that loan. And so you could buy a partial on that loan and get all the payments from that particular loan on a performing loan for 60 nut, uh, months. And then it reverts back to that original owner. So that's one way you can get in by just buying a certain number of months right from the beginning. So whether that's three years or five years or whatever. So buying a partial is another good way for people to get on using their IRA or even with their uh, other capital. So let me make sure we get this right. So a person can purchase um, a partial of your of your note. Correct. Um, and and you can do it for a length of time. Correct. You can say, okay, I'm buying a partial of your note, but I want to buy it for three years. Correct. So at the end of them three years, it reverts back to you for the whole deal. What he makes it goes back to his IRA or however he decided to pay for it. For it. I didn't know that part. That's yeah. phenomenal. That is phenomenal. That's phenomenal. It's right a great there. way for people to get into notes by just buying the first three to five years of the payments. You're buying a payment stream for five years. Wow. And again, guys, again, we want to be on this side of this of this type of deal where the banks normally will be at. The banks are in this in, in, in business to make money. So now we can move the banks out in this situation. We become the bank. That means we get that we get that extra money they're getting now. Right, <laughs> every single month. Now it may be a drip, so to speak, but if you got a Roth IRA, you got a little bit of cash in it. You don't care if it's a drip for three years, still going tax free back into your Roth IRA. So why? What well, doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so man, that's that's that is huge. That is huge. And I, you know, woo. Jarrell, you hear that, man? <laughs> yeah, I can't even on the end of it. I'm sorry about that, guys. Like wow. I said, I, so I, had a, uh, I had a call from a, a lawyer trying to get out the office out in Cali, and uh, I had to talk to him. So, um, Not a problem. yeah, 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 yeah we're, we're busy people, bro. We get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. Um, yeah, I, I get. I, I caught the end of that. Basically, he was speaking about um, being able to buy a partial of the note. That is something yeah. that I, I mean, I'm not I'm not really very, you know, well versed in buying notes myself, even though. Uh, I help in in facilitating the the loan of a note, but how it gets sold on a on the aftermarket and how it's it's, it's trickled down and split up, um, that's something I'm here to you know get a wealth of knowledge from. I know Cody um, definitely yeah. gets some gems on that on that note. Well, yeah. you know, Jarrell, Jarrell, uh, kind of what I think if I understand what you do is you originate hard money loans, and so a hard money lender is funding those loans yes and so that hard money lender could say you know i need to recapitalize quickly so i need to sell that hard money loan and, and so they do 
and they do. And so in essence, you're kind of one of the guys that starts that whole process by originating that hard money loan. The original loan, yeah. And so one of the things you might think about since you understand the hard money loan business is have some form of agreement with your hard money lenders that you get a right of first refusal to buy that loan if they want to sell it. So you originate it for them, they fund it, it's their loan. Now for a reason, they say, I need to sell this loan that they have come to you first for gotcha. you. You know, obviously you have to have the capital for that, but yes. but but that's a way for you to get on these hard money loans because that's what you understand. And so yes. I think that's a second stream of income for you. Yeah, I, I, I never really thought about that, having the right of refusal on yeah. the Yeah, yeah. Because I know they, buy, they sell them. They, mm, 50% of the lenders sell and don't keep it on their books longer than 30 days. Um, yeah. And then you know what that, the quality of that loan when you originate it. So if they come back and you say, I want to sell this one to you, well, you know, yeah, this was a good loan I made. Or no, this one here yeah. was kind of shaky. I don't Probably, want this yeah. one. So, you, yeah. so, 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 so you've got, I mean, Jarrell, you are set up perfectly for building your own note portfolio. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thanks, man. The only thing is, as I would say, is that in the state of Georgia, Georgia require. Well, you've got you. Do you have your NMLS license? No, I broker through um, lenders that have their MLS yeah. license. Yeah. So, in so, Georgia, so like California, you you can't. Yeah. Yeah. So in Georgia requires licenses as well to buy notes. So that might yeah. be a step you'd have to go through uh, yeah. in order to do that. But, you know, they might allow up to like four per year without requiring a license. That'd be something you'd want to check with your attorney on. But, you know, from the structure is what I understand that you do. Uh, you're well positioned to create a second income stream. Definitely. I mean, I put it in, uh, in the tool bag. I got you. I got All right. you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. A quick disclaimer. So we're not attorneys. Contact your attorney, your CPAs, and all that good stuff. Um, this is for any type of purposes only. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, okay. Uh, okay, man, that, that's huge, man. So I got a quick question for you. So, uh, uh, Mr. Cody, I've seen this right here. It says uh, four ways to uh, recapitalize. So, and they ran off about four different things. He said one way to do it is to, to sell the property. Uh, mm -hmm. The next one, it says uh, refinance the property, take cash out. Um, another one says sell uh, we talked about that a little bit. And it says, uh, what's the last one there? Borrow against the note. So how do you borrow against the note though? So I guess if you have a note and the asset is, is there, you can pretty much go anywhere and borrow against the note there, right? It's, it's backed by its actual real estate. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the term of that is. That, that's that's a, a collateralization of your note. And so you own the note or you're about to buy a note. This is what I've done a couple times and it's worked out real, real well, is that I'm about to borrow, buy a note. And so in order for me to fund that note purchase, I'm going to take out a loan from one of my other investors and use that money to buy the note. And then I promise a certain return back to that lender. It's just a mortgage. It's just a, a, a note against that note that I bought. So it's a promissory note uh, that I've collateralized by the mortgage I'm buying. And so a certain part of that payment is going to go to them. And then I get to, get to keep the overage. Typically what, I, what I'll do is I'll borrow on an interest only loan. And the bar, uh, you know, from that lender, from that investor to collateralize, I, I'm tr trying to make sure I don't get this confusing. Uh, but so I'm going to borrow money from another lender to fund this note purchase. That loan I'm borrowing, I want to be interest only to keep my payments lower. And then the note that I'm buying has principal and interest payments on it. So the payments coming in are greater than the payment I have to make on that collateralized note. And so I have an income stream gotcha. there over and above. And so, and so that's, there's actually kind of four different uh, kind of profit models in that collateralization type situations, because you don't have to make a payment to that, to that first lender that I'm borrowing from for 30 days after you bought the note. So you get one payment from the borrower. Okay. Then you get the spread between you, what your payment is that you borrowed at versus the spread from what the payment that you're getting in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I usually borrow a little bit more than I'm paying for. That way I put a little money in my pocket so I can, you know, 
go to Atlanta and, and yeah. see and see Darrell, <laughs> you know. And then the fourth thing is is when I, when I, when yeah. this loan matures, you know, and I pay off that underlying uh, mortgage, I usually sell the note for a little bit more than what I borrowed money from, so I get a little, another little profit model on that. So there's four different ways to make money for, for profit part uh, points on that particular structure. So there's, you know, one of the things that, that Lenny said before he got away in his introduction, he talked about creative financing. This is creative financing. This one's yes, yes, so yes. fun. You create yeah, money. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. So, yeah. so basically that, that interest only loan um, is not paying down. Every payment you pay is not paying down the, the note that you Correct. That you borrow, the principal. Right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And but it's principal, small enough. Oh, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, why, Jay, Go ahead. Why, why, but why not just get a small – is any option to get a small – a lesser interest loan from that first lender. You, you could that's not it's, interest it's, only. It's all negotiable. It's, just, it's yeah. all negotiable. Yeah, but yeah. the yeah. the I guess the the basically the beef in it for that investor is the interest only aspect. Yeah, you take yeah. that out, and it's not as advantageous. Yeah. Anymore. And, and I, I would I would venture to say that in some of the hard money loans that you originate, that those are interest only loans as yeah. well. All, all yeah. of them except for thirty year loans. Yeah, course. exactly. Yeah, any short term one year yeah. loan is going to be interest only. So you might ask some of your better uh, uh, hard money loans if they ever would they borrow? Could you borrow money from them collateralized by a note? Hmm. And then I'd walk, you know, I'd, I'd be more than happy to walk you through all the mechanics of that. So, yeah, but that, uh, yeah. 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 Excellent. Excellent. So we talked a little bit about, um, about non-performing uh, loans. And so I was doing some little research on this. So we were saying that a lot of times, man, um, of course you get them at a deeper discount of a non-performing versus performing. Right. So let's say you, you purchase a non-performing loan. You want to have, try to have maybe a 12 month season in there where that person is making payments consecutively by 12 months. So why is that important? Why do you guys think that's important? You said that <laughs> to make sure I understand the correction, uh, the, the question correctly. You're saying that why is it important that you have that you've seen 12 month seasoning on yeah. a note? Yeah. So, like, not okay. Not performing loans, basically, right? You you get them at a deep discount versus mm -hmm. a, a performing loan. So no, let's say, and a lot of times, you know, some people's strategy is to only get non-performing loans because they have different ways to maybe raise, you know, make some money off of it, whatever the case is. So, what you want to try to do is get that person who actually who, who, who's living in this property to make their payment consecutive, consecutively at least twelve months. Because after 12 months, they can go back and revisit this thing. Now it's actually a performing asset now. It's yeah. worth a lot more money in that situation. Yeah, I've, I've heard, I, I've never gam I've never gambled into buying non-performing anything. I mean, I, I like to see occupancy and anything that, you know, any of my clients are bringing to the table. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, Cody? I, I do. I yeah. Do. I'm because yeah. because I buy non-performing notes all the time, mm -hmm. uh, and, and because as 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 Jay said, you can get those at pretty significant discounts. You can get them at the lower of, say, sixty percent of unpaid principal balance or current value, current market value. So we don't use after repair value in the note business. We look at current value. And my goal is to try and buy that at fifty to sixty, maybe sixty-five percent of whatever the lower of those are. And so oftentimes it's a little tricky when the when the amount of the loan is higher than what the value of the house is, which happened quite a bit in 2009, 2010, 2011, when houses were underwater or upside down. So I'm buying the note at 50 to 60 percent of whatever the unpaid principal balance is or whatever the value is. And so once I own that note, what I want to do is I want to have a conversation with the borrower, with the homeowner on that and find out, you know, what's going on. Why are you guys not performing? What's going on in your life? To see if there's a way we can do a workout for them. And so if there was a workout that says, well, you know, my husband got sick. He wasn't able to work. He's working now. You know, I'm working now. Our income is much better than it was. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and find a way, a workout, where we can get them back on track and come up with kind of a payment agreement. 
Like if you can make your payments to me for the next six months at this amount, then I'll roll it into a modification and we'll formally modify the terms of your note to make it advan advantageous for you. And you get the opportunity to do that because you're buying that note at a discount. It gives you all that, that room, that spread that you can offer these kind of options, modification options to these borrowers. So once you've gone through that six months payment agreement, then another six months worth of uh, an actual formal modification, then you've got that 12 month seasoning that Jay was talking about. And now the value of that note is increased from what you have it. And so that is called a re-performing note. You have taken that non-performer. It is now re-performing. Re We've got a 12-month history of them making their payment as agreed. And now it becomes a, 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 a marketable product that you can sell for 60, excuse me, 70, 75, sometimes 80% of value or even more, depending on the strength of the file overall. So that's another profit model for you. Buy low, get that borrower to make their payments. We, we call it rehabbing the borrower. And so we get them back in and, like and they're that. making their payments. And now we have a re-performing loan uh, that we can sell back out. So yeah, so the 12 month seasoning comes into play its importance because it now shows that new note purchaser that your borrower's back on track. They have a, a, a consistent payment record and their money is protected if they're gonna buy at the price that I wanna sell it at. Yeah, um, cause you know, cause banks are not here to swing a hammer. All right. So once we understand the situation, maybe what needs to be done is probably whatever the case is, we have options, right? If they're not performing and they're behind a couple of months, we can foreclose on them in yep. that situation. Or, yep. you know, just like Cody says, whatever, you see that um, before they was making payments on time and now you see now both of them got a job and they both are doing what they need to do. It, it's, 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 it's a tons of reason why you would do a non-performing yep. uh, alone. It's, it, yeah, I can see that. That and probably if I was doing those, that's what I'd be going after. Because that's what yeah, that's what the meat is at. With, with the hard money lenders, they want to see occupancy. This is my realm. Yeah, yeah, they want to see they want to see yeah. some type of now in a bridge loan. They don't care about occupancy if it's performing or not. But any thirty year um, purchase or, or or refinance, they would like to see a lease in place performing. Was just different strokes for different industries industries yeah, different models they're right? selling yeah they're selling that note quickly so it must be performing it's just different strokes yeah, yeah one of the things that i that I, I think that your audience will enjoy is that when we're buying notes at our level the investor level or small fund level like i i play in is we have a better opportunity to help that homeowner Okay, where the banks and all the other stuff, it's just another number you're not paying. I'm either going to foreclose or sell this non-performing asset off. But at my level, we can do some things with our homeowners uh, and we can work some magic that they wouldn't be able to get if they were still were own, if the note was still owned by a bank. So here two weeks ago, I get a call from one of my borrowers. He owns a little property in Mississippi and uh, he says, hey, uh, I need some help. He says, my father passed away and I need to go up to New York for the, uh, for the funeral. And, uh, you know, I don't have enough money to make the house payment for May. What can I do? What can you do for me? So what we did is I said, well, okay, skip the May house payment. We'll take that May house payment and divide it by three. And you can make that up in the June, July, and August payment. After the end of that, he's back on track. Now, are you going to have a regular mortgage loan servicer or a regular bank do no. any of that? No, the guy no, just no. lost his father. He was already kind of having a situation. So let's be empathetic. Let's help him with that. Let's just forgive. It's not a forgiveness, but we're going to allow him to skip his May payment because he's going to be able to make it up in the next three payments. So we just divided it by three and added it to payments. And boom, he was happy with that. And mm -hmm. now he can yeah. go up and pay his proper respects for his father. Yeah, without that mm -hmm. over his head, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's huge. Uh, you know, the bank is basically gonna say, "Hey, man, well, there's nothing I can do because you're talking to uh, a person who just got hired, right? Who can't talk to the, his manager or her manager or case. Right. So yeah, no soul a lot of times. So <laughs> all right. So now one of, one of the things that I, I remember hearing Cody talk about, man, in this business, right? Uh, we talked about you know this is this investment is right, it's, it's truly passive. Right? Is it a hundred percent passive? Are we talking about ninety percent passive? 
99% positive or is it 100% positive? <laughs> now I know we're not attorneys and we don't play no. them on podcasts, but I'm going to give no, my attorney not. answer, and that is maybe it depends. <laughs> so it, it depends based on the quality of the mortgage, okay? And so if it's a performer that's been performing you know, month after month, month after month, that's pretty passive. And that's the ones yeah. I kind of like to put in my IRA. So I don't have to have all those other expenses of dealing with, you know, a non-performing or a low performing loan. So if they're just making their payments, it's pretty non pass or pretty passive. You don't really have to do anything like that. Uh, yeah. If the borrower's having some payment issues or some struggles or, you know, they forgot to renew their insurance or their property taxes get behind, all those things can impact the quality mm -hmm. and the security of your mortgage, then you have to get a little bit more active. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so, so it kind of depends again on what the quality of that underlying mortgage is that you bought. And that's, that's yeah. if you're an investor. Okay. If you're actually investing in mortgage notes. Now, the other thing I like to talk about is the mortgage business and I bridge city factors again, manages a note fund and that note fund is raised capital from investors. We have used that capital to buy notes to put in our portfolio. For those investors, it is a purely passive play. All they do is fund me the money and then I pay them back. We pay them a return on a quarterly basis. And all they do is go to the mailbox on the 15th of the month after the loan is, uh, after the, the third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter is passed and pick up their, their uh, dividend check. And so that's a purely passive play on that. So that's the decision that people have to make. Do I have some capital? I want to just invest and let somebody else manage my money for me, which, you know, I'll do that. Uh, or do I want to use my own money to actually purchase the loan, own it myself and deal with all the other activity that's involved in owning a mortgage note? So there's a couple different ways to make that active versus uh, passive play. Passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so hope you guys heard that. We have a lot of people actually kind of watching. Um, listen, this this is an opportunity. I know um, Cody got some stuff that's coming up down the pipeline here pretty soon here. So you guys got his information. Definitely give him a call. Look him up. See how you can get get involved in what he got going on. But if you you working a nine to five and uh, you know you should be in real estate some capacity, right? But you don't want to put in all the work. Maybe it takes to to do certain things or whatever. Reach out to Cody. Um, see how you can you know be passive and get that mailbox money that he's going to issue it out. I definitely want to be involved in that, man. <laughs> so mailbox money. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, and then so head, back I have, to your, head back to your hammock after you pick up the check. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I got another one here for you, right? So here's a good one, right? Who collects the funds? So if you're the note guy, where did the money go to? Who it goes to? That's a great question because I certainly don't want to have the money come to me from the <laughs> borrower, okay? Because exactly. so, so, so what I do is I work with, uh, with licensed loan servicers, specialty servicers that work with investors like I am. So every yeah. borrower makes a payment to a loan servicer, just like you guys may in your mortgage. You send your payment to a servicer. That servicer processes the payment and then remits the funds onto the investor of the loan. I'm the investor on the loan. I hire a service company to do all the paperwork and the payment application and track the reduction of the principal balance, make sure the insurance is paid, make sure the taxes are paid. Uh, and also the big deal is, is make sure they spit out all the tax documents. Uh, documents, the year-end statements, the 1098s, yeah. and that sort of stuff. I don't want to do any of that. I want to be as passive as I can. So I'll spend 30 to 45 bucks a month by having that servicer do that for me. I mean, that's 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 nickels on the grand scheme of things. And so yes. you don't have to actively self-service alone. In fact, I've made a part of my model. My decision is I don't want to buy a loan that has been self-service because they don't know what they're doing. And with with the Dodd-Frank legislation that's still in play and yes. the CFPB that's, that's still in play, yes. they manage yep. and require all the people that service loans. States require loan servicers to be licensed in their particular state. So I 
need to have somebody take that middle ground for me, collect the payments, and then remit the funds on to, to my fund. So but something so small as when you take over the note, right? You start servicing it yourself. Did you send that hello letter? Right? Exactly. <laughs> or, or that you know, letter? And yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal. If you don't know about that, you can put yourself in a in a bad situation. That's so all I, I agree with you. That's all RESPA. Yes, sir. Real yes, Estate sir. Settlement yes, Procedures sir. Act. So, yes, all that is RESPA, <laughs> the requirement. It's got to go out within a certain time frame of the acquisition of the so transfer. Time frame. Yeah. And so yes. that's, I let all those people, I have people that do that for me. So, yeah. The service company will take care of all that stuff for you. Yep. You know, so, and, and there's, a, there's a way that they know that actually everything's been taken care of as well. So, it serves for their benefit as well. So, I think that's a, that's a great thing. Have you ever a company right. calling so, faith servicing? Yes, I have. Yeah, yes. Okay. Cool. What, what is it called? Face Servicing. Durham? Face Thank Servicing. Uh -huh. It's a servicing company. Okay. okay. Now, now, now this next question, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit as well. So um, let's see if we can kind of dive in a little bit further. Right? Do you do you need a you know, debt collector's license in this situation? Right? To, to, to collect the debt in certain states, you gotta, you got to be licensed, right? It so... Depends. It depends. Yeah. Okay. It depends on the state. Okay. Uh, we talked about Georgia requiring a debt collector's uh, license. Uh, Illinois does. All the West Coast states do require that license. Uh, Ashley, what about Texas? Texas? Uh, Texas does not. It does not. Okay. It does not. Florida does not. Uh, the Carolinas do not. Uh, Mississippi does not. Alabama does not. I focus in uh, Michigan where you're from, Michigan does not require uh, a, a debt collector's license. Indiana does not. Missouri does not. Kansas does not. So, and there's a way you can look at these by going into the NMLS, you know, lookup, license lookup, and find out what states do and what states do not. And so, um, so, so it just, again, it depends. So, so I know a lot of folks that will don't have licenses, which I don't have any licenses. So I'm very careful about the states that I select. Uh, I'll probably go for my NMLS, NMLS license shortly, uh, which will allow me to have uh, available in certain states, but certain states still require that additional level of being a debt collector, even though you've sent it over to a loan servicing company because you are purchasing the debt, certain states' laws, statutes require that you have the de debt collector license yourself. So, mm, okay. Ah, wow, that's a, that's a good one. Man. This um, talks about, and, and really what you're illustrating here, Jay, with your questions is, is there's some complexity to this, okay? There's yeah, some complexity yeah. with this because you're doing with it kind of on a national basis for the most part, rather than your neighborhood. And so, you know, a wholesaler yeah. knows the laws and things within their state and their neighborhood. But if you're going to buy notes, like I don't buy any notes in my state of Oregon or in the state of Washington or a state of California. I stay out of the West Coast. So I'm most yeah. of my stuff is all east of the Mississippi for that matter, although I do some things in Missouri and Kansas and uh, Wisconsin and things like that. So most of I guess I would say it's east of the Rocky Mountains, although I have yeah. one, uh, some in Nevada as well. So, yeah. Nevada, okay. doesn't um, Nevada, Nevada doesn't does not require a license. Yeah. But they are very, very sticklers yeah, in the are. court system uh, for foreclosures. So you have to have all your ducks in a row if you're going to foreclose in Nevada. Wow. Okay. You also have to have so a network of attorneys, you know, and I don't know if that was what your question is, because the states that require a judicial foreclosure, you have to have a network of attorneys uh, who are going to manage the foreclosure for you. So part of your analysis during the, during the due diligence period is if I have to foreclose on this house and I have to assume a worst case situation, what are my attorney fees going to be that I'm going to have to pay out and still keep this being a profitable profitable acquisition for me. So, this, yeah. you know, there's I have income analyzers. I have, uh, you know, deal analyzers that I look at to make sure I'm acquiring that property at the right cost. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to come out of pocket for additional money to foreclose on. And I don't want to do that. So, yeah. So. All right. So I, I can hear something in this question, right? All right. Do you need the LLC before you buy a note? Any notes, right? You need an LLC. 
I know you don't want to do these type of things right under your personal name, man. Right? Yeah. So you, yeah, I will say yes. Get you get you some set up that protects you in that situation. I would answer that by saying you don't need one, but you should have one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because because you know, people nowadays, as, you know, well, how do I say this in a couple of different ways? Is that you know, buying a note is not buying a piece of real estate, and it can be considered security. Uh, so if you're if you're soliciting money to buy notes, that's considered a soliciting for a security. Yeah. And the SEC and the state, yeah. uh, you know, Department of Finances get involved in that. So people do sue. You know, and so and so you want to make sure that you have that shield of protection against your personal stuff. And that's why an LLC is important. You know, remember, an LLC doesn't save you anything in paying taxes. What it does is provides you a shield against lawsuits. A layer, a layer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that shield. So you don't have so your your personal stuff is is not. Uh, at risk in, a, in the event of a lawsuit. In fact, what I've done is I have actually registered my my fund and Bridge City Factors are are two entities uh, in the state of Wyoming because the state of Wyoming does not require you to identify the personal owners of the LLC. So yeah. it's hard to breach that when this attorney wants to find out who the owners are. They can't find it because I'm registered in in Wyoming. Wyoming. Uh, shields that for me, it masks it for me. So that's an additional uh, a level of protection. entity protection. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So excellent, like a, excellent, man. So like an incorporation, they list they it masks the owners of the absolutely. Incorporation. Yeah. Yep. Pretty true. So that's, what, what? That's more widespread yeah. though, um, audience, rather than finding a, a state that does it for LLC because LLC does list articles typically in most states, um, but in corporations um, as a whole another ball game where it doesn't list on public sites, the owners of that corporation. Go ahead, Jay, I'm sorry. So, so what about, uh, what, what kind of rate of return are we talking about when it comes to notes? Um, if we're looking at what five, ten percent, twenty, thirty percent, I know each deal is, is different, but kind of like a general uh, number, roughly. Well, kind of what I look for on performing notes is to try and calculate a way that I can get at least a ten to twelve to fourteen percent return. Okay, and That's the way you do that, the way you do that is by buying them at a discount. OK, yeah. if it's an if it's a uh, if it's a reperforming loan, I want to get it at about 16, 18 percent on a return. And if it's a non-performing loan, I want at least a 24 percent ROI. And oftentimes, if you buy right and keep your expenses to a minimum and it's very, very fast turnaround time like taxes, you know, you can sometimes get 35 to 45 percent return on those uh, if you can buy them, foreclose remarket those sell them out very very quickly to return your capital uh and so a, a lot of it depends on on you know how active you want to be you've got your network set up you know whether you're going to rehab them yourself before you sell them off or whether you're going to sell them as is if you acquire them back through a foreclosure uh and so so it's it could be anywhere and that's part of the calculation what am i going to be happy with in a worst case scenario with the type of return for my capital and do i have investors involved what are what sort of expectation do they have as a return so uh yeah. but it can be it can be very very lucrative so i mean one of yeah. the things i did is if you if you had uh if yeah. your target in an ira was like a nine percent return you would only need about 24 to 25 notes to pay you 15 grand a month. And so, you know, 9% is a good target for most situations. I think all of us would be happy with a 9% return in an IRA. And if I had the capital in order to buy, what, what did I say? 24, 26 notes, you know, I'm going to pay myself $15,000 a month in income that could be totally tax free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's 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 pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So one thing, one thing I learned about this right here, man, that um, from from my understanding, right? So I've been in this business for a while. I've been on the multi 
I've been on the wholesaler side, uh, the commercial side. So, and it's it's crowded in those areas, right? Would you say in in, in this particular arena, the mortgage notes are probably less comp uh, less competition? I know yes. you probably, I know you probably, you see, you're around people who are doing that, right? So you see a lot right. more than the average person said, see. So coming in the game, people are not coming out, coming in the game buying mortgage notes and doing other stuff first, but it's less competition, man. It really is. Yeah, it really it's is. I, I, banks, small branch banks. Well, you know, small batch, uh, batch, uh, small banks, um, uh, you know, if they have a portfolio of, of loans that they need to recapitalize every now and then, I mean, that that is obviously, if you could get into that and be a consistent buyer from them, then they're not going to shop the loans to other other buyers. Uh, but there is less competition in the note market because, because it's kind of interesting. Uh, if I go to like a dinner party or I go to some sort of, you know, social engagement and people ask what I do and I tell them, you know, I, I buy promissory notes secured by real estate, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know? yes. No idea yes. whatsoever. Yes. If I go up and say, <laughs> if I go up and say I've got, you know, 10 rentals, they understand perfectly what I'm doing, you know, or they yeah. say I, I, I'm a rehabber, I rehab property, they ex know exactly what I do. And so, so it's a little unique. And, you know, so the competition is growing, because more and more people are finding out about it. But unless they're properly trained and have an idea what's going on, they're going to fade out, because I know a lot of people that got all excited about this, tried to put their their feet into it, put their feet in the fire and find out it's a little bit more complicated than they have an understanding. So they fade out of it. There's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, but the competition is is less, uh, especially the higher up in the food chain you go, which basically means that the closer I can get to the actual owner of that note uh, before it's been sold two or three or four times, uh, the less competition I have because most, you know, most folks out there don't have a huge amount of capital out there. And that's why I, I come bring them to the marketplace a fund where I can raise capital from investors who want to invest passively and raise million of millions of dollars, which I can buy in larger quantities versus somebody that maybe has, you know, a 401k that they rolled over and have $150,000 of that, that kind of limits how much they can acquire. And so, mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's, you know, the higher up the food chain you go from an acquisition, you know, and so my market, my marketing is completely different as well. You know, as, as most folks that are dealing with acquiring real estate, you know, they're marketing to sellers of that real estate, whether it be an out of state landlord or, you know, whatever that might be. I, I don't deal with those people. I deal with whoever owns the notes or, and I market to those folks or I market to, uh, to folks who have capital to want who have money that they want to invest and that's my two marketing thing it's more of a business to business type of approach versus a business to consumer type of approach and so it's a little bit different from that type of uh, strategy as well yeah would you say a, a wholesaler right would have um Okay, some of the techniques that we use to find the owners of some of these properties, right? When we find some of the owners of these properties, we realize that they're in a tight situation. Would you say um, if a person was to transition into to do uh, mortgage notes, that could be a plus? Because we realize that this person is behind on his mortgage note, uh, um, behind on his mortgage payments or whatever the case is. And we, we, we obviously have the name of the company or the bank that is a uh, loan through. But I guess we still have to get to the person who makes the decision when it, on the bank side, I guess. Right. So we have to uh -huh. acquire skills for that side. So I think I answered my question. Own question. <laughs> well, so. you, you know, uh, I have never been made aware of somebody who's looking to acquire a property that ends up buying the note. So, so that is generally not an avenue because most of the sellers of a note don't, unless they're a privately owned note, don't want to sell it, uh, sell one at a time. Most of the better quality loans the, uh, uh, sell in large pools. And that's where I, and it has nothing to do with the homeowner. You don't want to deal with the homeowner uh, in order to, uh, uh, to acquire the note. You want to keep them completely out of it. They're not involved whatsoever. And so if you have a property you want to wholesale, you're, you're working with a seller, 
and you want to wholesale it, they're in distress or whatever. I've never been aware of any situation where that particular wholesaler is able to buy that note from that lender. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. 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 All right. So we have a, another one here. So can all title companies close more, uh, mortgage notes? You go to a title company to, to acquire these properties? They're, well, you're not, uh, you're not, acquiring new title insurance so but you do close either through attorneys or escrows and so they can do that uh, typically most of the ones i don't because i have due diligence i know my sellers and so uh, i know the quality of what it is uh, but if there's underlying liens that need to be paid off or a number of different things then it's always better to work through an attorney or an escrow company to make sure that the underlying liens do get paid off uh, so it just it just kind of depends on the structure you can use an escrow and a, or an escrow attorney to do that uh, or uh, but most of the time that that isn't necessary yeah okay so i was looking this up here so i, I i've lost my place in there, but i've never heard of FBI insurance. yes yes yeah that's mandatory we would say right because if a person for a person that doing those you think that's mandatory well, it's not always mandatory. It, be, it stands for force place insurance or lender yeah. placed insurance. And part of the requirements that are spelled out in the note in the deed of trust are that that homeowner must cover the property with fire and extended coverage or a homeowner's policy, at least for the amount of the mortgage is outstanding. And so if we determine that that insurance is not covered, that house is not covered, then we issue that policy through one of our vendor uh, insurance companies and and that is called fpi or force place insurance so that happens on loans that we are aware of or property that we know of that doesn't already have an insurance policy on it uh, by that owner so it's not always mandatory uh, some lenders like to do it just in case but i don't think it's enforceable to have double insurance on a property so uh that that yeah, might be a so. question yeah yeah <clears throat> Because oh, wow, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not no. But but here's the deal: so if a person is behind on their mortgage payment, chances are they're gonna be behind on their insurance and all that good stuff as well, mm -hmm. right? So if you you acquire a property, they may be five six months behind, or whatever the case is, you may want to <laughs> acquire about that insurance or get that FBI sure. yeah. insurance in place, yeah. and then when they can show proof that he actually has it, then you can take it off, yeah, or whatever the case is, right? Correct. Mm, that's yeah. that's what's important because you don't want to acquire that note and the house get burned up. Yeah. And all of a sudden you out of your money. Correct. That can be a devastating. Yeah. <laughs> that can be yeah. Very devastating. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, and, and property taxes as well. There's When I go through due diligence, there's three main things I look for, okay? And that's title, to make sure the title's clear or I have the complete documentation of all the title that's transferred, which re is reviewing that a launch or endorsement to the note and then the assignment of mortgage that assigns it over my company. So title, taxes, I wanna make sure that the taxes are current on that house. And if they're not current on that house, then I will reduce my offer to buy that note at the same amount that the taxes, taxes are delinquent. Uh, and the third thing is value. So, so you have to make sure as best as you can with the understanding that you're not gonna get an appraiser to go inside that house to see what the interior looks like. And that's where the BPO comes in. The broker, broker's yeah. price opinion, uh -huh. uh, along with any other models that I can, I, I think I have 10 or 11 models that I look at to try and determine value as well as having actually a, a broker's price opinion. So those three things, taxes, title, and value are the three most important things when determining the value of that particular note that you're about to require. Absolutely. Listen, this has been action packed. This has been action packed. I got one more for you. One more for you. So, so I, I see this thing online uh, platform where it's telling you where, where you, we can find these kind of properties from. Are you familiar with a uh, paper paper stack? Yes, I am. That oh, is one of those exchanges platform. that I referred about. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, okay. they're growing. They're popular. I bought I bought notes from PaperStack. In fact, I'm one of the guys that runs PaperStack is doing an interview of of me here in the next couple of days. So, oh, oh, I read, man, that's why we're at the conference. Yeah, so 
Okay. So, so, but you, so going through paper stack, you're able to do one offs. You don't have to buy them, yep. um, uh, a group of them or something. Like okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there's sellers on Excellent. that that will sell partials too. So, you know, you should go in and sign up for paper stack. It's actually one word with no K at the end of it. And, uh, and okay. that way, uh, you can, you can sign up for paper stack and you can see what they have to offer there. And so if you want to buy a partial, because maybe you're limited and you want to give a try on something, you can look for those there. Uh, and they will handle the whole transaction. They will handle the exchange of money. They will handle the documents. They will. There's a purchase and sale agreement that's involved there because uh, you're still buying an asset. So they handle the whole things. They handle the escrow. They get a little fee for what they do. Uh, but oftentimes, there's two things I would say. One is, is they're going to manage the process for you if you're a newbie. Uh, but the second thing is, it's kind of the bottom of the food chain, meaning that you're going to probably pay a little bit more for that purchase because they're selling one off. So it's like anything. If you can buy a quantity of something, that's why the prices at Costco or Sam's Club are lower because you're buying bigger <laughs> quantities of it versus what you're getting over at Safeway or, or Kroger's. That's true. That's true. Listen, man, hey, hey Cody, Mr. Cody, you knocked it out of the park again, man. Um, uh, as you guys know, I mean, you see, man, this is what Cody does. Um, definitely reach out to him. Definitely reach out to him. Yeah, yeah. See how you guys work Tell me all this stuff, Cody. Uh, yeah. Tell, Sorry, tell him how to reach you. you. Uh, well, uh, the easiest way is the email that I have listed there uh, is Cody at BridgeCityFactors.com. Uh, just shoot me a quick email and say, you know, I have this scenario. I want to ask more about this or whatever. And, you know, uh, I, I love talking with people and, and kind of give them an idea, you know, come with some concrete questions and, and expect, you know, not an extended conversation because I am fairly busy. But, you know, I can give you some direction on maybe what the next step is or maybe some, some scenario questions as well. And also, if you're an accredited investor and have some capital you want to invest, I'd really like to talk to you. Absolutely. Man, as, as you guys can see, he's a wealth of knowledge, man. We really appreciate it, man. Um, so buying mortgage notes, man, I've learned a lot. Uh, by doing this, the study that I did, man, and the stuff that you, you broke down to, you really kind of you simplified it for us. And, uh, and it's good to know that here in Texas and in my hometown, Michigan, we need to work together because I know a lot of places in Michigan, we need to work together on that, and especially sure. in Texas yeah. as well. Uh, I, I like Michigan, we I like together. Texas. That's yeah yeah so. absolutely. absolutely it's gonna like us both too man <laughs> <It's time laughs> to make some money together brother I love it. <laughs> yes sir yes sir so listen man every two weeks every what in two weeks from the day on wednesday i get this confused a lot of times hop yeah. on man if you guys want to be a part of this definitely reach out to me um you know we want to pick a particular topic about you know this week i said notes I'm like, man, okay, so let me learn about what you do. Because I know we, we talked the other day about a particular deal I was trying to get done. And so you go through what you got to do. I'm like, okay, okay, we need to do some more research on that. So now when I run across something like that, I know exactly who can get that thing done. So I really appreciate you. All right, really thank you. you. Thank you for asking and, me to be part you of guys, this. No, any, hey, man, I appreciate you, man. If you guys learned anything, give us a thumbs up. If you didn't learn anything, give us a thumbs down, <laughs> right? It don't matter. Share it, like it, all that good stuff, and hit that notification, man, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Hey, man, I appreciate you, Mr. Cody. All right. Thank you, Jay. You have a great one. Thank you, you for your time. All right. Have a great rest of your day.